Well, good afternoon, friends. Good afternoon. Hopefully, you're having a, a great uh, start to a week here. Happy Monday, everybody, and uh, welcome. Welcome to another uh, episode of um, Conversations with Dune and Friends. Uh, today, we have a, a fantastic guest joining us, and uh, hopefully, you'll join in, in the conversation as well as we uh, talk with uh, Barbara May. And uh, let me do a quick introduction uh, before we uh, have Barbara join us for an hour and a bit here. Uh, so, Barbara, can you still hear me in the green room there, my friend? Wonderful. Uh, Barbara May has uh, spent a lifetime knowing how to get up after a fall, uh, but she figures uh, doing that and uh, getting a laugh at the same time is a lot more fun. She is a formal national level gymnast, award-winning coach, uh, aspir aspiring drummer, and mother of two who joke um, her way into the Guinness World Record by performing the longest stand-up comedy show in history. With more than two decades of work experience behind her in the uh, fields as, as diverse as uh, sports and recreation, education and not-for-profit management, uh, entertainment and government, uh, Barbara brings a unique, powerful mix of uh, personal stories, humorous examples and real-world insight to help people uh, in the audience understand and embrace her key messages. Uh, if you need to get back up, anything is possible. Friends, please help me in welcoming our wonderful guest today, Barbara May. Hi, Barbara. How are you doing today, my friend? Hi, I'm very well, Dune. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Thank you for uh, taking the time to join us. I know, uh, like many of us, you have many different balls in the air. And uh, uh, to reserve some time to uh, chat about this is going to be uh, valuable, both um, certainly for me and our guests and, and uh, folks who view it in the recorded uh, version as well. So folks, again, if you can hear us uh, chime in and uh, feel free to comment, feel free to ask Barbara questions and uh, put it on her hot seat a little bit if you like, but not too hot, okay? Not too hot, but uh, a little bit is fine. So Barbara, tell us a little bit more about your background. Um, what got you here today, my friend? What are, fill in the, the, the blanks a little bit for us. Well, you know, it, it's it's kind of hard to know, you know, what to tell you because there, you know, I have thirty years of experience. And were you born I mean, in Edmonton? I was born and raised uh, in St. Albert, actually. Okay, there you go. So, uh, well, there was no hospital in St. Albert, so technically, I was born in Edmonton and then uh, spent most of my life, all my life, in St. Albert. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what led me here, what sort of started things off, is watching Nadia Comaneci at the nineteen seventy six Olympic Games. I had just come home from football practice and uh, my brother was pretty upset that I was trying out for the football team because back then, you know, girls didn't play football. But uh, I came home, I was all excited to tell my mom I made the team and she said, well, why don't you, you know, take gymnastics instead? And I looked at the TV and Nadia Kamenich was on the balance beam and she performed a perfect 10 and I just fell in love. And I ended up becoming a, a gymnast and then a coach. I started coaching when I was 14. And my career just kind of went from there. So I um, spent 15 years teaching coaches how to coach with the National Coaching Certification Program. So I've worked with coaches from all different sports. I also have a Bachelor of Education degree. And I've been a phys ed teacher, a special education teacher, and a school counselor. And then uh, I started my own business. And what I do now is I teach team building seminars and leadership training, and I help people get past their stumbling blocks. Cool. Uh, that's fantastic. And I know you have quite the, uh, uh, not only the company, but the branding. And, and the, I, I love the your logo and, and your uh, symbology of all the stumbling blocks. We'll get to that uh, in just a few minutes here. But thank you for filling us in. I uh, well, I didn't know you were born in St. Albert or, you know, obviously Edmonton and then the, uh, back to St. Albert because uh, when did St. Albert, that's just a pop quiz for you here. Hey, see if you know St. Albert really well, <laughs> born and raised there. When did St. Albert have a hospital? Uh, you know, when, when, when was it built? Do you remember? Well, I can probably <laughs> figure out the year. So what happened is my mom had uh, four children mm -hmm. and my brother and uh I think two of us were born in Edmonton and then my little brother and sister, they finally built a hospital in St. Albert. Yeah. So um, that would have been sometime between 72 and 74. Mm -hmm. 
And then what's interesting about that is when I had my firstborn, Amanda, she was born at the old Sturgeon Hospital, which was on McKenney Avenue mm -hmm. at the top of the hill. And they tore it down after, shortly after she was born, built a new hospital. And my youngest was built in the brand new Sturgeon Hospital. Mm. Wow, cool. Cool. So, you know, I live in Sherwood Park and uh, it's fairly recent that we have the hospital kind of operationalized. It was sort of built a little while ago. And then uh, uh, so so it's kind of nice to uh, see that transition from, you know, uh, the town or city that we live in from from no hospital to now have another hospital there as well. So that's cool. Uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, you know what we're going to do? We're going to actually um, advance right to the present, and then we're going to okay. actually take some uh, uh, trips down memory lanes, and we're going to uh, explore some stories and insights and, and uh, you know, sharing from those. Uh, but but uh, current day, let's, let's go right to current day with COVID being the context for all of us. Uh, uh, what are you up to these days, my friend? Well, you know, things were a little bit scary when uh, COVID first hit. And, mm -hmm. you know, there were a lot of unknowns and all my in-person training got canceled. Mm -hmm. Everything. Mm -hmm. So I went from having a full calendar of uh, leadership training and team building seminars to nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, oh, my goodness, I don't know what I'm going to do here. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, two months later, I had picked up a contract with Purolator. Mm -hmm. So now what I'm doing is I'm helping Purolator out. They are super busy, of course, with everybody ordering online now. Yeah. And they are hiring about 200 people a week across the country. And my people per week, 200. Yeah, it's cool. it's pretty crazy. So basically what I do is I team up with a Purolator workplace trainer. So most of them are courier drivers mm -hmm. that they pull off the, the road to do training. Mm -hmm. And we're doing virtual training. Mm -hmm. So we spend a week with the new employees. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we teach them everything they need to know about Purolator, about safety, about how to do their jobs. And it's all virtual and it's all online. And we have people from all across the country. Mm -hmm. So, so with uh, Pure Later, you can actually say, you know, later on in your uh, in your bio, in your kind of resume, you say hey, you were part of the movers and shakers. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I don't know if they shake, but I know they move. They move stuff. <laughs> well, and now I know exactly what happens to a package. You know, when you when you you call Amazon and you want to order something, mm -hmm. I know the whole process, and it's pretty amazing. Like they have conveyor belts, and they have trucks, and they have people that onload the trucks, and people that offload them in the next location and brand new scanners that tell you exactly where your package is the whole time. Wow. So it's been it's been really interesting learning about their company and and uh, Purelator is actually investing five billion or sorry one billion dollars over the next five years in growth mm -hmm. and it's a Canadian company mm -hmm. and they hire Canadians all across the country. So mm -hmm. I'm like happy to be able to to be yeah. working and to be supporting them with their new hires. You're part of the solution. You're part of the solution. As much of a problem that COVID is for all of us, uh, let's find a way to be part of some solution, even if it's different than the vision that we had. Let's face it, COVID has changed uh, how we all uh, <clears throat> are impacted and how we, we execute on our vision. So uh, I'm glad you're able to uh, kind of go with the flow and kind of um, contribute where you can. Well, and it's also giving me the opportunity to get really comfortable virtually and online. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've been a coach and a trainer and a speaker all my life. And the thing that I love is connecting with people live in person mm -hmm. and, you know, helping them take their skills from here to here. So teaching online is a lot different. And at first I was like, oh, this is, I don't like this at all. <laughs> like, like I want to be in a classroom or in a you know ballroom talking to people. But the beautiful thing is, is I'm adapting and I'm learning how to work effectively virtually and uh, and gaining a new skill set. So mm. now I'm looking at my business a little more strategically and I'm thinking about the leadership training that I developed. So I was working with a, a company, the Family Solution Group, and they loved the work I did. And they said, can you develop our young leaders? Mm -hmm. And what happens or what's happening is they're um, the owner. She's preparing to retire mm -hmm. and her son and daughter are coming up as well as as they're training a bunch of their other staff to be able to take over. And they asked me to develop a leadership training program for them. So we developed nine days. So nine separate days. And in this case, we're we're offering them one day a month. 
-hmm. And it, it's a great way to train people because you get to um, do the, the seminar and then they go and they practice the skills for a month and they come back and then we build on it. Mm -hmm. So now I'm looking at how can I take that program online and be able to offer it to more people virtually. Mm -hmm. uh, that reminds me of uh, the idea that the, you know, when the world is turned upside down, <laughs> like it did in here in this photo, you got to just roll with it. You got to roll with it, right? <laughs> yeah. Tell us about this photo while I'm at it, my friend. How old were you? Was this in St. Albert? Oh, uh, this was in my backyard in St. Albert. And uh, we had moved into a new house up in Mission Avenue. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was dealing with stumbling blocks, you know, as a kid, my mom, um, and dad ended up getting divorced and uh, we moved up to mission. Mm. Just, um, you can see my legs are all bent and I'm, uh, you know, pretty clumsy. But at that point, I thought I was amazing. <laughs> and uh, I, I said to my mom, I love, I love gymnastics. And I loved it so much. I actually took the bus downtown every Saturday to take lessons yeah. by myself, by the way, when I was 11. So, in this picture, I think I was almost 12, and uh, I convinced my mom that I wanted to be in the competitive team. And we went up to the owner of the Edmonton Gym Club, and her, her name is Dagmar, and she's European. And uh, my mom said, Barbara would really like to be on the competitive team. Yeah. And Dagmar was like, no, 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 Barbara is too <laughs> old. I was 12, and I was too old. So what I did is I thought I need a way around this. I'm not going to let her, you know, her um, decision about me being too old, too old be the final decision. So what I did is I found a brand new club in St. Albert. It had just started mm -hmm. and uh, I went and tried out. And because I could do a back walkover and a back handspring, they were like, you're in, you're on the competitive team. Yeah. And I had a wonderful coach. Her name was Carlene. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if you have the picture with me on the balance beam, but you can see after another year, just the the transformation that I made in terms of my skill development. So I was um, took that that back walk over that I did on the in the backyard with my legs all bent. Learned how to do it with straight legs. Learned how to do it on the line and the floor, and then eventually onto a high beam. Mm -hmm. And at the time of this picture, I was ready for my very first gymnastics competition, and uh, I was so nervous. Like I have never been so scared and my palms were sweaty and, you know, my knees were knocking and we were at this competition and I was so bad. I fell off the beam five times mm -hmm. and uh, I got off the beam in tears. I was crying and Carlene came up to me and, and she's like, are you okay? And I'm like, I fell off the beam five times. She goes, but you got back up and that's the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, that lesson, that life lesson that I learned at such a young age or maybe an old age, depending on, <laughs> on your perspective, um, has has really served me through my entire life. So when I fall down, I know I can get back up mm -hmm. and it might it might be painful. It might take time. I might need help, but I can get back up. And that's that's a, a very important belief system that I have. And and it's allowed me to to get through some really tough times. Yeah. Yeah. I want to highlight a couple of things you, you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, again, there are, were people who said rightly so based on the field and how competitive it is and in, in sports being what it is at the top level says you were too old at that mm -hmm. time, you know, 12 years old, too old. But, but so one sort of insights is don't let that be the only decision, the only sort of factor. Uh, you went around it, you, you found a way. Uh, and then the other thing is that you had a, uh, high level of uh, confidence in yourself in terms of you thought you were awesome and we have to be uh, really be mindful uh, when we have young kids and young you know teenagers who, who who or even younger who believe they're awesome at something and perhaps they're not at uh, you know, as awesome as they thought let them let them think they are because that will, <laughs> will energize and motivate and propel them to the the, the greatest level possible so, so let's encourage people who who uh, who are you know inspired by by the the stuff that they do and and just support them and encourage them and then the third thing is um 
you, you, you got something really well done. And based on that particular skill, you were, uh, that was your competitive advantage, you said, right? So, so the idea of, uh, you know, you don't have to be good at everything, but, but in all of that you do, find a way to be good at something that really stands out uh, above the crowd, if you will, uh, then you'll be noticed for that and opportunities will come based on that. So, so those are three things that I want to bring up from your stories there, uh, Barbara. Well, and what ended up happening is the gym club started growing. Mm -hmm. And so when I was 14, they said to me, hey, you know, you're a really good gymnast. Uh, do you want to be a coach? And I was like, sure. I mean, I can do cartwheels. How hard can it be to teach kids how to do cartwheels? <laughs> and uh, well, I found out and um, and I'll never forget this one little boy that I was coaching. He was six or seven years old. And his name was Spencer. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't interested in watching me do cartwheels, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm up there trying to just demonstrate as if just showing something is the best way to teach because I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And he had he was he just was like, I'm out of here. And he jumps up and he races past me while I'm upside down in the cartwheel. And I, I instinctually landed the cartwheel mm -hmm. and started running after him like I chased him across the, the, the whole gym. And when I finally caught him, he was hanging on the rings mm. and, and I, I didn't know what to do. Like nobody taught me how to be a coach. So I grabbed him, I threw him on the ground and I sat on him because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want him to run away again. And I looked up and his parents had come into the gym. Yeah. And I was like, oh no, I'm going to be in trouble. And they were like, all right, you caught him. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I, I don't I, I don't I did, usually sit on people anymore, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do want to mention, tell us about this uh, Joey fellow. I think you know him, <laughs> right? You know him, I think. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, top-notch, like world-class drummer and uh, many other talents. But tell, tell us about this fellow who says, we're sounding great. Joey, I'm hoping we're also looking great. Not just sounding great, but but looking great too, mm -hmm. Joey. Yeah, tell us if, if we're looking okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Joey is my, uh, I guess my life partner. He mm -hmm. also helps me out in my business and uh, he's just a phenomenal drummer mm -hmm. and uh, he, well, he's, he's world-class and uh, he has toured all over the world playing drums and uh, he's a, fr a freelance artist. So he has the opportunity to work with a, a number of different artists. And I think, I think I sent you a picture of him playing at the big Valley Jamboree. Yeah. But he, some of the artists that he's worked with that people might know are um, Dwayne Steele, uh, who's uh, from Alberta here, Chris Cummings from out east. Uh, he's worked with uh, Shania Twain, um, Brett Kissel, like you name it. He's he's probably worked with them. And what happens with a lot of the freelancers is when the a lot of artists um, are traveling, uh, sometimes they don't um, travel with a band. So what they'll do is they'll have a band out west and then a, a band out east. Yeah. So a lot of times when they're out touring throughout Alberta and BC and Saskatchewan, then they'll call up Joey mm -hmm. and uh, he'll learn the songs. And And it absolutely amazed me when I first saw him do this because what he does is he'll get the CD or the recordings from the from the artist and then he sits down with his headset and a piece of paper and he charts it out. So in the same way that you or I might write something out, he has drum notation, he charts it out. And then he sits down and plays with them. Mm. And it's note for note. Mm -hmm. And I've actually seen him like walk up to an artist, say, hi, nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll be the very first time they've met in person play with them and at the end of the show i'm out in the audience and people are going wow this band is so awesome you know how long have they been playing together <laughs> and, and i don't have the heart to say well it's really cool to watch yeah fantastic uh, by the way joey augmented his previous comment about us sounding great uh, based on my nudging he also said we look fantastic <laughs> 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 at least you look fantastic so, so uh, Barbara, uh, we'll uh, show a lot more photos and, and some, uh, a bunch of videos as well. <clears throat> but before we go into those, uh, tell us, my friend, what is your view of, um, you shared a little bit of a story about how you adapted to adapted to uh, COVID times here with, with uh, you know, being part of the solution. Um, but what's your feeling on uh, uh, post-COVID? If you think, you know, beyond COVID, uh, do you have a picture of what that looks like? Um, again, just, just your view of what might be. 
Um, what I'm really hoping, I would love it if things would just go back to normal and we could get back to socializing and being with our friends and, and going to events and live events, because I really think that, that people are, are social beings. And, you know, during COVID, I really saw this uh, with my grandson. He's six years old and he was so unhappy. You know, he had his mom and he had me and he had Joey, um, but he didn't have the happy little kid that he is. And it was, it was, you know, heart wrenching to watch this little guy who really likes playing with his friends, you know, be stuck playing with grandma. And it's not that he doesn't like grandma. I mean, we, we have a great time together, but as soon as he was able to start playing with his friends, he, he was happy. So for example, on Saturday, he was at my house. And as soon as he got here in the morning, the first thing he said to me is, I want to call Penelope. You know, mm -hmm. can we text Penelope? And mm -hmm. so I texted Penelope. And unfortunately, Penelope's starting dance class, which is great. She's dancing, but she couldn't come over. So I'm like, you know, who do you want to call next? He's like, let's call the boys. And, and we have two boys that live down the street, Jack and Wes. And so I texted them and they were like, yeah, we'd love to come over. And, and it, it was so awesome just to watch the three of them play and and they played Meg formers and they mm -hmm. played for like three hours straight, not one fight. Mm -hmm. They were just so happy to, to be with each other. And then that made me really happy just to see them having so much fun. Yeah. So I'm hoping we can get back to normal. Um, I, I think um, the best way for us to do that is to really keep up with the social distancing. I know um, some places are starting to have live events um, I was talking to a speaker friend of mine and she was in Wetaskiwin a couple of weeks ago doing training for the city mm -hmm. um, or the town, I'm not sure uh, which it is. Um, but they were spaced out two people per table in a big ballroom. There were only about 20 people there, but they were able to have the live training. Mm -hmm. So I'm really hoping we can get there and, uh, and, you know, get back to where people can be with their friends yeah. and enjoy live music and, and enjoy coming to speaking events. Yeah, yeah. Now, I want to uh, share a video from uh, on your website here that, that shows you in action speaking at uh, conferences and whatnot. Uh, uh, maybe give us a, a quick intro of that clip before I, I <laughs> play here, my friend. Is this the speaker demo view, you uh, bet. video? You absolutely, on your website, yep. Um, so basically I want to give people a taste of what my style is like. So I've spent a lot of years, um, honing my craft. Um, one of the reasons I did stand up comedy is I, I was really good at teaching people. I could make them cry. I could, you know, <laughs> teach them, but I had no idea how to make them laugh. And, uh, so, uh, that's why I started doing stand up comedy. So what I wanted to do in this demo reel is just give people a real sense of what my style is so that when they hire me, they're like, yeah, that's what we were expecting. This is what she does. This is what she's good at. And, you know, every speaker is a little bit like we're all different, right? We're all unique and we bring unique things to the table. So in this demo video, I just had to give a really good um, overview of what, what it would be like if you came and saw me live. There you go. Let me know if you can hear the audio. Sure. I was hanging upside down it. in the cartwheel, getting ready to do my dismount when I heard the bell ring. Ding. And I said, I fell off the beam five times. She said, but you got back up. And that's the only thing that matters. Now that you're gone, I feel well, I knew how to do cartwheels, but I had no idea how to coach. And I don't know if you've had that experience of being asked to do something that you really have no idea how to do. And it's like, oh, you'll figure it out. Well, this is how I figured it out. I'm upside down in a cartwheel, and Spencer, a seven-year-old boy, jumps up, races past me, almost knocks me over, because he doesn't want to learn how to do cartwheels. He wants to hang on the rings. So I'm chasing him over the beams, under the vault. Finally, I catch him. He's hanging on the rings. I didn't know what to do. So I grabbed him, threw him on the ground, and I sat on him. <laughs> I looked up, and his parents had come into the gym. <laughs> they were like, all right, you caught him. <laughs>
When we're feeling stressed, we need to recognize what, what does stress look like for us. The doctor looked at me and he said, your lungs are full of blood clots. Two of them are stuck in your heart and you're going to die. Or we could give you an emergency clot buster and you might hemorrhage in the brain and die. What would you like to do? If you think about the times in your life when you've gotten past your stumbling blocks, there have been skills that you've used. The key is for us to figure out what those skills are. When I work with teams, we talk a lot about stumbling blocks, and one of the biggest stumbling blocks that teams have is communication. All right, okay, what are you sitting for? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, um, it says RCMP there. Yeah. You're a policeman, nice to meet you. It's much better under these circumstances, don't you think? <laughs> All right, so have you ever done a cartwheel before? <laughs> the reality is we all have stumbling blocks. And the only way for us to learn and grow is to get past the stumbling blocks. Hand, they, oh, yeah! Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> so I'd love to say something about the artist that you heard singing the song. Her name is Chris Aries. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, hanging upside down in the carpet. And yep. she is she's one of the most incredible singers I've ever met. And um, when Joey and I first dated, um, she was living in Alberta and uh, we had a or he worked with her a lot and I had a chance to hear her sing a lot. And she's since moved out east. But when I was putting my promo to video together, I thought, you know, that song would be perfect. And I, I didn't want to just use canned music. I wanted a real song, you know, with a with an artist that I knew. Mm -hmm. And I called her and I said, hey, would you be willing to let me use your song? And she was like, I would love that. She said, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to let everyone know to, to look, check her out. Chris Aries is her name. And she's absolutely phenomenal. Now, uh, help me with the spelling. Is it just the way it sounds, C H R I S. She's she has a little. Well, Chris is is Chris, and okay. then she has a, a. I think it's A R Y E S. I think it's right in the front of the video where I do the intro. It does list it right there. Oh, okay. Then that's fine. I will uh, leave that then. Uh, all right. So um, thank you. Uh, You're welcome. Tell, tell us a bit more. Uh, you know, in terms of. Uh, you have all kinds of different things. Uh, I'm going to go to the comedy side of thing. You know, you sure. have you are the holder of the Guinness World Record. Is it still standard that someone else, um, uh, you know, kind of top that? Do you know? So, so what happened with that is there were 35 comics, mm -hmm. and we were at the um, Comedy Factory, mm -hmm. and we did a 28 uh, 28 hour show. So it was 28 <laughs> hours straight. And um, so, yes, I do think somebody has topped it now. Mm. Um, but at the time we set and held the record and it was like it was hard. Like, mm. it, you know, it, it, it kind of sounds funny. But what we did is we set up two stages mm. so that we could keep the show going. So so that the wait, wait staff would have time to clear the tables on one side of the room and then we could bring right. in more people on the other side. Mm -hmm. But what happened is partway through we, we got to about one o'clock in the morning. Mm. And the comedy factory is a, a very clean room. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is, is the owner, um, Bob Angeles, he doesn't want a bunch of swearing on his stage. Mm. So at about one o'clock in the morning, I'm in the back resting. And all of a sudden I hear all these words that I should not have been hearing at his club. Mm. And I'm like, oh no. And I, I, I go and I, I look inside the room and one of the comics is up there. And he was basically just being a jerk. Mm. He knew that he wasn't supposed to to mm. use that kind of language at this club. I mean, at other clubs, it's fine. Mm. But he he knew what Bob mm. wanted at his club. And he was just being a jerk mm. and uh, pushing Bob's buttons. And Bob, I, I turn around and look, and he had steam coming out of his ears. He was so angry. Mm. And he's like, that's it. We're going to shut it down. 
right now. We're going to shut it down. If, mm -hmm. the, if, you know, if that comic's going to act like that, I'm not, I'm not moving forward with this. And I said, Bob, I'll take care of it. Why don't you go home, get a good night's sleep, come back in the morning. I'll make sure everything goes okay. Mm -hmm. So, so um, at the time I had five minutes of material. So mm -hmm. I was brand new to comedy. I had five minutes mm -hmm. and, and Oh, your, your uh, sound got cut out there. Um, I wonder if, if you might have to um, check out your audio there. So, um, so while Barbara is doing that, uh, let's see, um, when you have it figured out, uh, say something so I, I can. Get okay. It. Well, it, oh, it, it, yeah, it's still on. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We're back. Okay. So I don't know where I lost you. So long story short, um, after his set, most of the guys left mm. and there were three of us left to make it through the night. So one mm. of them, one of the comics was videotaping because we had to put, uh, enter the videotape as evidence that we completed this mm -hmm. and then Rob Pugh and I, mm. so I would get up, I would do my five minute set. Then Rob would get up and do 55 minutes. Mm. Then I'd get up and do five minutes and then he'd do 55. Wow. And then at about five o'clock in the morning, some friends of mine from Calgary, they had shows in Calgary. They drove up, arrived, arrived about five in the morning. So they were kind of our reinforcements. And then the people that had gone home for a good night's sleep came in. We made it all the way through the next day, mm -hmm. did the 28 hours, and uh, and we are in the Guinness World Record. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, every worthwhile thing uh, are going to have uh, stumbling blocks along the way, as you say, and uh, you just got to work through them. And sometimes uh, luck can chime in along the way. Sometimes others will uh, pitch in. Reinforcement can come, but, but you got to survive the moment to to have reinforcement sort of matter. So, so thank you for sharing that again. And um, yeah, so, so I mean, in the work that we do, speaking and training and whatnot, uh, were you in the, uh, I was in a workshop in, I think it was in Winnipeg one year when we had the CAPS convention there. So, so again, CAPS is the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers. And uh, uh, Barbara and I, uh, actually tell us uh, a little bit about uh, your role in, in that in the past as well. But, but um, so I just put the, the name there so that people know uh, what that is. So, so I actually attended a, a session where three kind of, uh, comedian <clears throat> slash, uh, you know, really funny people did a workshop and then they, 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 they actually sold DVDs and workbooks and I bought those and I worked through them. And it was kind of interesting to be reminded that, you know, uh, injecting fun uh, does take learning and does take work. It doesn't just happen naturally. Well, comedy is one of the, probably the toughest skill I've ever learned. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have done flips on a high beam with no hands mm -hmm. and comedy is harder. Yeah. Um, so, um, when I first started doing stand up, I, I got a hold of Judy Carter's book, Stand Up Comedy the Bible, mm. or um, the Comedy Bible. Sorry, it was called the Com. She had two Stand Up Comedy the Book and then the Comedy Bible. And I loved her books. I learned so much from her books. And then, of course, from being on stage and, and taking workshops from comedians. So, uh, to bring back uh, or to answer your original question about caps, mm -hmm. I've been a member on and off for, I don't know, 15 or 20 years. I think 2002, mm -hmm. uh, I went to the Vancouver convention. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been a while and I've, I've held a number of different roles. I've been treasurer, I've been membership or sorry, treasurer, program chair. Uh, and more recently I was president of the Edmonton chapter. Mm -hmm. And what's really cool about, uh, about that year is we hosted the national convention here in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. So uh, Wayne Lee and I were both on the board. I was president, he was vice president, and then he took on a role as chairman for the, the conference. So I said to him, I said, you know, I would really love it if you could get Judy Carter to come to our convention, because I'd really like to meet her. And uh, so he he made that happen. And I was able to meet one of my comedy heroes um, here in Edmonton. and. And she was absolutely wonderful. So she had a new book out uh, called, uh, I think it's The Message of You. Mm -hmm. And so she now works with speakers as well as comedians. So she was really happy to come to our convention. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, I got this bright idea that in minus 30, it would be really cool to show her around Edmonton. <laughs> so <laughs> there's, there's actually a, 
there's there's the picture of Judy and I. I, I also have a video on my website of it's on my blog and it's Judy uh, and I outside in minus 30 weather and she's from LA. Mm. So she was freezing. Um, but it you know, it's one of those things that in hindsight, I'm like, hmm, maybe we should have stayed at the hotel and, and uh, <laughs> skipped the tour of Edmonton in minus 30. I remember that was a cold year. Yeah, it's funny because I go, I went to a convention every year for the last 11 years, every year, where whichever city it happened to be, Toronto, Vancouver, Halifax, uh, Ottawa, you name it. And the one year that it was in Edmonton, I was so busy with client work, like I typically, uh, you know, kind of book that and, and take the trip. And so I committed myself. But here I was in my hometown, Edmonton, if you will. And uh, and I was so busy that I actually missed the survival photo. Uh, we'll get to that uh, in a few minutes here, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, because I, I had to go home and, and get some sleep and, and uh, do something uh, kind of mid middle of the night there. But uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, You're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we have lots of fun with uh, Caps there as well. But uh, uh, tell us about the uh, the work that you do with uh, uh, stumbling blocks. Uh, I'm going to actually maybe uh, just just uh, take a go back to the website here, and you can tell us uh, what people will find on your website uh, when they go there. There you go. All righty. So, um, well, they'll find a video of me speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and then they're going to find uh, just just a little bit about stumbling blocks and uh -huh. uh, how I came up with the idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, that looks like the homepage there. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's funny because with uh, the comedy thing, you know, with the issues we had trying to get through the Guinness World Record, I find with a lot of workplaces that I work with, mm -hmm. the, the issues come down to three things. You know, communication is a huge issue for a lot of a lot of groups or companies. Uh, conflict is another one and stress. Mm -hmm. So I tend to emphasize those three things in my talks. But what I do is I work with the people that hire me and I say, what are your stumbling blocks in your workplace? And then I customize a workshop. So sometimes I'm doing keynote speeches where I'll be on stage in front of 200 people. Sometimes I'm doing more of a team building event. So these pictures right here, Dune, that you're just scrolling on, this is a workshop that I did and it was a team building workshop. And what we do in the team building is we wanna have fun as well as learn. So what I do is I use the blocks as a metaphor and I come up with activities that the group can do together. So we have the team building or the team bonding component, mm -hmm. but I also talk about whatever issues it is they're having. So if their issue is communication, then we talk about communication and the effect of, or the breakdown of communication and the effect it's having in their organization. Mm -hmm. Or if stress is an issue, then we talk about stress. So that's my main focus in the team building. And then I also do leadership training. And as I mentioned earlier, I developed a nine, nine day uh, leadership program and um, Basically, a company can book me for all nine days. It could be uh, once a week. It could be once a month, their choice. Or if they'd like, they could take a look at the topics and I could customize something specifically for their team. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. So uh, I just love the, uh, the, the, the your logo and the symbology, the, the stumbling blocks and the colorful you know mix of the colors that, that you have there. Uh, I think... Um, I, I think I've seen some of that on your van as well. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're committed to that direction. <laughs> yeah. So, so sometimes people ask me, they're like, how did you come up with stumbling blocks? Like, what a cool idea. How'd you come up with that? Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened is I had massive pulmonary embolisms and I almost died. Mm. So I, I mean, I seriously like was turning blue. Mm -hmm. I was um, rushed to the hospital when I got to the hospital, they put me through a CT um, scanner and, and discovered that my lungs were full of blood clots and two of them were stuck in my heart. Mm -hmm. And the doctor said to me, you're going to die mm -hmm. or we can give you an emergency clot buster and you might hemorrhage in the brain and die. What would you like to do? <laughs> choices, choices. <laughs> um, I was completely blind at that point because all of the oxygen, like I was, they were pumping air in, but it wasn't getting in. Mm -hmm. And what ended up happening is I, we went, and did the clot buster and I lived, mm -hmm. well, obviously I lived, um, 
but um I was really kind of lost after that. I was like, okay, why am I still here? And, you know, I just felt like I was going around in circles. You know, I could teach coaching courses. I could teach, do motivational stuff. Like I was teaching career and employment workshops. So literally, you know, 12 different topics I would teach on. And um, one day in one of the workshops, this woman wrote on her evaluation form, Barbara is excellent at detecting people's stumbling blocks mm -hmm. and helping them get past them. And I just went, stumbling blocks? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what I've been doing my whole life yeah. is helping people get past their stumbling blocks. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So again, as usual, it's always uh, either our audience members or our clients or, or, or our friends and people who uh, observe us uh, that, that gives us the uh, key thing about uh, uh, what we are and who we are in terms of how they perceive us and how they uh, get value from us. So that's very cool. Listening is key, I guess. When we when they say things like that, we have to listen and, and uh, decide. Cool. So again, our viewers can go to uh, your website and find out uh, lots of great stuff on there. And you have a blog as well. That, uh, uh, but, but we're going to... Um, get into that time machine we're gonna go back way back okay we're gonna go way sure. back when the video resolution was uh, rather poor by comparison i'm gonna go to i think i'm gonna go to your blog where where i think there's um uh, is it bright night or something like that mm. uh, tell, tell me if i yeah get so you know lots of times we talk about networking and how important that is mm -hmm. and uh because i met bob angeles at the comedy comedy factory and did a lot of work for him mm -hmm. um as a uh, an opening act. Um, he um, he called me up one day and he said, we're, "They want you know they want me to come and do a commercial. Do, you know, do you want to play my wife in the commercial? And we're going to have TV kids." And they were promoting the Bright Nights at Horlock Park and here in Edmonton. And I was like, "Sure, I'd be happy to do a commercial." So what they did is we had to go outside it, it, at night because they wanted to shoot it at night so you could see the Christmas lights, mm -hmm. and it was. It was it was it was not too cold that we didn't want to be outside, but it was cold enough that uh, we were standing there and we're you know we're all wrapped up in Christmas tree lights and we've got our two our two pretend kids and uh, <laughs> we're pretending we're a family getting ready to go to bright nights and all of a sudden this kid yells out he goes snot drop and I'm like what and I look over at Bob and he's trying to be all cool but you know his nose is all red and because it was cold out um he needed a tissue but our hands were all tied up and we're waiting for the camera and we weren't supposed to be moving and uh, uh Bob was like just an incredible pro he just he they said roll and he was ready to go so yeah. it was a, you know it was a fun experience to do the commercial and i was really happy that he asked me to be part of it you bet again you know the circles that we operate in uh, the friends that we hang around with the colleagues that we uh, work with um, often have an influence on the opportunities that we get along the way and sometimes it could even surprise us in terms of the kind of opportunities that that actually come up uh, but if we look at it closely and, and decide to to take on some of those opportunities um, it really adds to uh, really uh, our life experience i think mm -hmm. so let me know if you can hear the sound Sure. This holiday season, I can hear something magical happening in Horlack Park. Something the whole family will want to see. And you can see the entire display from the comfort of your own car. We've just come from there. It was unbelievable. You've really got to see it for yourself. There's the new Sugar Plum Village. Gingerbread Man and the Lady. Bright nights. You've just got to see it for yourself. Jack in the Box. Lollipops. Santa and his sleigh. Very good. Cool. <laughs> so that that brings up back so much, so many memories from uh, what what year would you say this was, or roughly, or oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think in it was a, a after, decade. Is it like uh, yeah? I think it was after we did the Guinness World Records, and that was in two thousand and two. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it would be around that time, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so almost twenty years ago, eighteen years ago. Yeah, very cool. Now now while we're on this uh, blog. Uh, screen i'm gonna bring up another one as well uh, tell us about this one where this season, um, it's, um happening in let me just Park. see here uh the next blog that i'm gonna bring up buffet uh, royale hmm. tell us about that you did some commercials apparently uh, not more yep. commercials. <laughs> more so commercials. 
so this they they uh, liked the first one we did, and we got a phone call saying, "Hey, we want to do a commercial for Buffet Royale." Uh -huh. So we got a house this time, uh -huh. and uh, and a you can see our uh, our our television family there, and then they got Bob to dress up. You'll see it, but he, he got to dress up in a costume. Mm -hmm. So it was just, you'll love it. It's it's really funny. Yeah, yeah. Let me just uh, confirm here. Give me a second. So, um, yeah, we'll have some fun here. Mom, where's dad? Getting ready for dinner. Where are we going? To Buffet Royale. Well, what? Buffet Royale introduces tempting and succulent rock roasted rooster to its vast all you can eat buffet menu. Choose from over 100 delicious Chinese, Western, Italian, and Ukrainian culinary items, including a large salad and dessert bar. Buffet Royale, <laughs> now serving rock roasted rooster. <laughs> now I gotta ask, did you, uh, were you were you involved in the uh, four two six five zero oh, five zero? Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but I do remember that. I do remember that. Uh, Long yeah. before skip the dishes, hey. Yeah, yeah. If you're hungry, call the Lido. A hey, free delivery. They said. <laughs> uh, cool. Well, while we're in this mode here, I'm going to actually bring up uh, one more and uh, just another uh, blog entry here. And uh, let me just go ahead and and uh, bring it in here and. Uh, uh, tell us about this uh, this one here where, uh, let's see here, uh, I believe um, you were at some computer software thing, Bcom, where oh. I actually built many of my computers buying parts from Bcom computers. So I, I know this uh, this this uh, company, but tell us about this clip here. <laughs> so so Bob, Bob calls me up, he goes, they've got another commercial for us and, and you got to dress up like a rebel and, you know, can you wear and put things through your nose and stuff and i'm like like what <laughs> and and then we get there and they had this big box mm. so it, like a fridge box or something mm -hmm. so the idea was we were going to do a transformation so you have to imagine what was going on inside the box while we're trying to shoot the commercial it's it's pretty hysterical mm -hmm. yeah but let's uh Ideas stuck behind an identity crisis? Need some shaking up? Get power and performance for an awesome digital experience with an Intel Pentium 4 processor PC at all three locations of Vcom Computers. Redefine your digital identity and experiences. For all our current prices, check out www.bcom.ab.ca. I do. <laughs> cool. So, cool. So it's so funny because when I saw the commercial, I'm like, geez, I don't look very rebellious. <laughs> but that that was kind of the best I could do. That, that was all I had. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, tell us a little bit about, you did some work with, is it Shaw Cable or I guess Access Television? Access tell us Television. About that. Yeah. Access so television. this 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 goes back a few years. So um, Access Television used to be owned by the government, and mm -hmm. uh, they ended up selling it to Moses Neimer uh, from Much Music, mm -hmm. and uh, so he took over. And what happened is he came in and he came up with this new show called Learning and Job News, mm -hmm. and it was it was like all the shaky camera work and you know really fast cuts and that kind of style. Mm -hmm. And what the learning and job news was about was about getting jobs and going mm -hmm. to school. Yeah. So um, I was at a networking event for the Edmonton. It was being held for the it was for the Edmonton Chamber of Commerce at the Edmonton Sun. Mm -hmm. And I got on an elevator and I ended up meeting the publisher of the Sun. And uh, we started talking and there was another woman in the elevator and she introduced herself to me and and uh, I discovered elevators are a great way to meet people. Mm -hmm. um, but she was going to be on the show that night. And she goes, oh, you're a communications coach. She goes, why don't you come with me? Mm. So I was like, OK. So I, I go down to Access Television and I met the producer and uh, he was telling me about his show. And I said, I said, sure, I'd love to be on it. So next thing I know, mm -hmm. I'm being interviewed on this TV show. It was all about learning and jobs. And I mm -hmm. talked about communication. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the show, I said to the producer, I said, that's a really awesome show. Like, I really like the concept. Um, you should interview business owners. 
Like, I think it'd be really neat if you interviewed business owners and he goes, great. When can you start? <laughs> so, so this is long before I did comedy or, you know, even before I did the commercials. So I was like, well, I, I guess I could be on TV. Okay. So my very first, uh, first day, what I did is I lined up three interviews. Now mm -hmm. I realize now how crazy this was, but one of the people I interviewed was Neil Wilkinson. Mm. And you may know that name from Toastmasters. Mm -hmm. He was the president of Toastmasters International. Mm -hmm. So not just the club, but the entire organization. Mm -hmm. And he also owned Bar Call Doors. Mm. So I went and I interviewed Neil and I was horrible. I was so <laughs> nervous. And, and uh, I got back to the, uh, to the studio and, and somebody walked me through how to edit the story because I hadn't done editing before or anything. And I had to basically jot my notes down of what I wanted and then sit down with the editor and then he would do all the cuts. Mm -hmm. And at the end, we called the producer over to show him my first new story, right? <laughs> I'm all proud of myself. He goes, this is terrible. <laughs> we can't, we can't use this. I'm like, well, Neil was really good. Like, cause Neil's smooth, right? He mm. was great to interview. And the producer says, yeah, he's really good, but you were terrible. <laughs> he goes, what were you looking at? And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, well, when you were talking to us at the end, you were like looking all over. And I'm like, well, I was talking to my audience. <laughs> and he goes, Barbara, it's television. Your audience is right here <laughs> in the lens. So I said, well, could I redo the ending? Mm. And then we'll just edit it together, cut and paste. He goes, yeah. sure. So the next day I wore the same clothes, but we were at Access Television now. Mm -hmm. And I found the hallway by all the executives and I, I shot uh, the ending there. We pieced it together, it aired. Well, Neil calls me up and he goes, he goes, Barbara, he goes, that was a great story. And I love my new office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so from there, um, after about six months on the Learning and Job News, I at it they decided uh they wanted to try and do some seminars and workshops on communication mm -hmm. and to promote them we didn't want to eat up commercial air time because that's how they make their money selling commercials so we came up with the may we talks mm. and they were in the same spirit of the the body breaks if you remember the body breaks yeah yeah and uh so we did uh i think we did 13 uh short clips so around a minute each on different aspects of communication. Yeah, and just for those who do remember the body break, there's a little jingle that says, don't just think about it, do it, do it, do it. Remember that? <laughs> uh, here we go, I'm gonna bring it in and uh, we're taking a trip down memory lane here, very cool. There's nothing more confusing than a sad message delivered with a smile. Do you want cream without coffee? Except perhaps a happy message delivered with a frown. If you want to communicate clearly, it's important that your facial expressions match your thoughts and emotions. Have a great day. Enjoy the coffee. Thanks. You're welcome. With a little practice in front of a mirror, you can use facial expressions to help you communicate your ideas. It may feel silly, but practicing your facial expressions will help you to communicate your ideas more clearly. Can I sit here? Sure. The right look can make all the difference. Very cool. So uh, Access, I remember watching Access TV uh, quite a bit back then. And uh, yeah, very cool. Now, I do want to highlight again, here's another example where you cited essentially failing or falling down and stumbling and, and then do not give up though. You got up again and, and you say, well, again, try to solve the problem and say, uh, how can we make this still work, uh, right? Because many people would have uh, given up there and moved on and maybe even swear not to ever do public speaking again or, or TV again. Uh, but you were trying to solve the, the problem and, and came up with the idea of, well, you know, we're going to just shoot it uh, at the office there, there at Access TV and, and you made it work. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that was that lesson I learned, you know, as a gymnast, just how important it is to get back up. And we all have stumbling blocks right? We stumble, we fall, it's part of life. And uh, the key is, what do you do after you fall? How do you get back up? 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> gymnast falling is just how you that's part of your profession to be honest falling is just that's part of it uh, you, you fall enough so eventually you decrease the likelihood of falling but uh, but you gotta fall a lot and that's why they have those uh, big mats or what do they call those things those big crash things. mats there you go <laughs> yeah so uh thanks for sharing that uh, your time with um do you have a highlight from your um time with access tv was there a particular kind of memory of it that that resonated that that uh, you want to kind of tell us a story of because you were there uh, for a little while right yeah um well i had a chance to interview a lot of business owners mm. and uh i mean obviously interviewing neil sticks out because it was the the first interview that i did but i interviewed a lot of great business owners and what really stood out for me was how they really wanted to find good staff. Hmm. So, you know, I think sometimes we get a little frustrated with our bosses and, you know, we think. Oh, your voice just went away there, Barbara. So if you could mind the microphone, whatever that uh, caused it. So, uh, you know, um, when you finish that story, I would love to hear a little bit more about Toastmasters as well. So. Yeah. So doing. Can you hear me now? Is that yeah. better? Yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, yeah, so I think what really struck me there was that the employers or the bosses, hmm. you know, the business owners, they really want to find good staff and they really want the people they hire to succeed. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times, you know, when I'm dealing with uh, clients and I'm working with their teams, I think sometimes we lose sight of that and and we think, um, you know, the boss is out to get us or, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes there's that conflict that just happens. Mm-hmm. And I think if we can get back to what we're all there for, which is to work together to, to create a goal, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, Joey always says, you know, less of this and more of this, right? Mm-hmm. We, we want to work together. And I think the key in, in all the years I've been working with business owners and with employees, I think the key is people need to feel safe. Mm-hmm. And if they feel safe in the workplace, they can work through anything. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times the comments I get from people and after I work with their teams is, you know, now we have a common language and we can talk about the problems and we can talk about the challenges and the hurdles. Mm-hmm. And what stumbling blocks does is it gives them a safe way to say, hey, it's a stumbling block. We can get past it. Let's work together. Yeah. Yeah. Again, have a, a quick handle, a quick, almost like a, well, it's like a, a, a safe sign that says uh, that's, that's all it is. It's just a stumbling block rather than pointing fingers and, and uh, try to see who to crucify. Uh, let's work together just like bands would on stage. If one person makes a mistake, you don't go and look at them and, and, and kind of make a big deal out of it. You figure out how you cover. You figure how to move from there very quickly in uh, real time. And uh, uh, because the audience, um, you know, we owe that to the audience, right? To, to make the best of the, the the show that we have. So I'm going to bring in another video here, Barbara. And this is, uh, it talks about, uh, again, it's a May, May We Talk, and it's about uh, vocal variety. Uh, tell us a bit about that. And, and I know you've joined Toastmasters and you quite enjoy your time there. And I know it was quite uh, instrumental in helping you uh, develop your uh, confidence. Tell us a bit about Toastmasters and, and then I'm going to play this video. Um, so what's really fun about this video is it is full of Toastmasters. Mm. So when we came up with the idea to shoot the May We Talk videos, I figured we could shoot 13 videos in two days. Mm. <laughs> That's how naive I was. Mm-hmm. And so the first video was shot at the St. Albert Farmer's Market. Mm-hmm. And the chamber let us use their beautiful location there. And uh, for, this, for this video in particular, we... Um, worked at the Inn on 7th. So it's, it goes by a different name now, but it was the Inn on 7th. And I liked that hotel because it had huge windows with lots mm. of natural light. But we needed people to be in the audience to make it look like, you know, the hotel was full. We couldn't just go into the hotel and start shooting in the restaurant. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had to bring my own extras. Mm. And what I did is I phoned up all my friends from Toastmasters. (laughs) I said, I'm shooting these videos. Can you come to the Inn and Seventh on this date and spend the whole day with us and be an extra? Mm -hmm. So everyone that you see in there, 
um, in this video in, in particular, all the people in the audience or, or in the restaurant in the background, they're all Toastmasters. So you might recognize some of them. <laughs> Very, I love the story. And again, you, you know, you have a vision and you do what it takes to realize the vision. You don't say my role is this, my role is that, and I'm going to ignore the other stuff and then figure out why your vision didn't come to reality. Uh, you, you fill all the parts necessary and, and uh, of course, reach out to others like you did there with your Toastmasters master's friends. Uh, so I'm going to uh, just uh, click play here and uh, we're going to uh, experience this again together here. And uh, let me just take that out here. Have you ever listened in on someone's conversation? You can tell a lot about what people are saying just by listening to how they sound. Yeah. <laughs> However, it's funny, I gotta tell you, the market two kids. So you don't give them those things. You can have emphasis and meaning to your presentation simply by changing your vocal variety, by changing your pitch, pace, and volume. Just remember to pause at the end of each thought to allow your listener to think about and absorb your ideas. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. So Toastmasters, Access Television, uh, it's, uh, it's quite a, I'm sure you look back with some fond memories at that whole segment of your life, hey? I do, you know, and like for me, it's always about taking on new challenges. And um, I know we're going to run out of time here soon, uh, Doom, but I would really love to talk about uh, my experience as Executive Director of Alberta Racquetball. Oh, we, we definitely have time, my friend. Um, you know, officially we advertise for one hour, but but if you don't have clients to see, I don't have a clients to see, we can yak on for a little bit. <laughs> sure, as long as my mic holds up, I'm just a little worried about it. No worries. Uh, you know, yeah. when it does skip, it just skips a few seconds before you correct it. So no, not a big deal. Okay, perfect. So tell us about the racquetball. <laughs> <laughs> so I... Um, I was hired to be the executive director of the Alberta Racquetball Association, mm -hmm. and I knew nothing about racquetball. <laughs> so I had played There's a, a theme couple here. Times. There's a theme here. Yeah. <laughs> so I had played a few times with my brother as a teenager, you know, when racquetball was like a total fad and, and everybody was I playing. I remember that, yeah. Um, but when I came on board, it was kind of a dying sport. Um, mm. So courts were being closed, and we were having trouble finding coaches and, and attracting new players. So we had like all these amazing players that were in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and even some into their 70s who loved the sport. Um, but we we weren't able to attract the new players. And what I realized was happening is it, when someone new would come to the court, so imagine a 19-year-old um, uh, teenager, well, 19-year-old young man who's been playing soccer or football or hockey. He's a great athlete, but mm -hmm. he doesn't know racquetball. And he's like, hey, I want to try out this new sport. Mm -hmm. What would happen is he'd go to the court and then one of the older guys would say, here, I'll play you. And he would he'd, he'd kick his butt right? Mm -hmm. because the old guy had all the skill. He knew how to play the game and the 19-year-old didn't. And I, I was like, okay, this is not working. Like we are not attracting new players mm. with this dynamic. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to develop a program that could be a win-win. Mm. So the, the, the 40 year old player, or the 50 year old player could be on the court, still have a good experience with the 19 year old, but use his knowledge and skills to help that 19 year old learn the game. Mm -hmm. So I, hired or we hired Chris Odegaard who was the Canadian national champion at the time to come and spend three days with me on the court and we developed this practice program and we ended up touring across Alberta teaching the racquetball practice program and at first Chris did not want to be on camera he was mm -hmm. he was uncomfortable he didn't know how that was all going to work and and we videotaped every night and every night we'd go back to the hotel and debrief and watch the videos for two hours, just like a play by play. Mm -hmm. If you would stand here, if you try this, if you said it this way. And we were working with uh, Joey. Joey was working the camera so that he could get the angles he needed too. And we ended up 
um, bringing in. So after teaching across the province and and really honing the workshop and and the the progressions and the plan the way we wanted it, we brought in three of the top juniors. So these were three. I think they were 16 to 18 year olds. They were fabulous players, and we brought them on the on the court with Chris and shot the videos. And the videos have uh, well, they were well over 500,000 hits last time I looked, mm -hmm. and we've received comments saying they were the best racquetball videos on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, Joey, I presume Joey McIntyre. Yeah. So, so your Joey. My Joey. Like that guy right there. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna replay his. I'm gonna replay his thing as if he talks to. Uh, yeah, you're sounding great. He says, looking yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, <laughs> thanks for sharing that. And again, you know, a common theme is, um, you know, be open to new opportunities. Uh, if you're passionate about, about making it work, you will learn the necessary skills and also bring your other skill set into the mix. The fact that you have some uh, great skills with public speaking and great skills with interviewing, great skills with all of those things, it makes this particular journey um, you know, you can almost um, use your other skills to kind of uh, prop this one up a little bit while you're learning more about uh, uh, racquetball or whatever have you. So, so transferable skills and, and what I'm going to call, uh, uh, I don't want to call them soft skill. I want to call them foundational skills that are very much uh, uh, are going to help you with your next project, even though the project seems to be very different than what you've been doing. Yeah. And I like to think of them as building blocks. So, mm -hmm. you know, I help people turn their stumbling blocks into building blocks. There you go. And that is so perfect. Uh, it's like you are watching my screen. Are, are you? Uh, do you have no. a remote thing to my screen? <laughs> I have that screen. I was about to pull it up. There is the building block example right there. What I was actually um, trying to, to to will you to do is to put up uh, the racquetball pictures because one of the highlights of my life um, was was helping Kobe Iwasa become a four time national champion and a Pan American Games uh, bronze medalist. Yeah. So in gymnastics, uh, gymnastics is a you know very well developed sport, and I coached, I competed at the national level, but I coached at a provincial level, and for me to be able to work with um a, a athlete like kobe and his dad who was his coach and my philosophy was if we can help his dad be a better coach mm -hmm. and get his dad the skills that he needs then um, we can help kobe become you know or go as far as he wanted to in the sport mm -hmm. and in his case he won in one year he won the 18 and under boys single 18 and under boys double, mm -hmm. men's open single, men's open double. So four national titles in one year, and then went to the Pan Am Games and won a bronze medal. And I had the opportunity to go to Toronto. So this was in 2016. I went to Toronto and watched Kobe um, play. So um, there's a picture of me inside the court in Toronto at the Pan Am's games. Um, so this is Kobe. Um, this is, uh, you can see Chris Odegaard in the background. So uh, Kobe is, I don't know, probably 12 years old in this picture. And and we had already brought Chris on board to help us train our coaches. And as I mentioned, develop the racquetball practice program. And then if you go to the next picture, let's see what you got next. Uh, I. Look for something that says 2016. Yeah, we're going to fly through and you tell me when to. OK, that's the end of this track. So we're going to go the other way. This is like uh, finding that card. We're magicians trying to find that, that card that people. There, oh, there no, we right. go. OK, there we go. So this is uh, Chris Odegaard and I at a provincial training camp. And this is where we're going through the uh, racquetball practice program with all our athletes. Mm hmm. That's a great photo. That's a great photo. Um, you, you're like right in your element there in action. And, uh, you know, look at all the uh, everybody's paying attention and uh, very cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks for sharing that 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 segment. How long did you uh, this particular gig or this particular assignment or this particular? So journey? eight so eight years. I was with Alberta Racquetball for eight years, and mm -hmm. and if you, I think if you keep going, you'll see a picture of Kobe playing at the. Um, there he is. So this is after he won the bronze medal. Mm. And you can see we're inside the court. So for the Pan American Games, they brought in glass courts mm. so that we could have spectators along the side and you yeah. could see everything that was happening inside the court. Right. So this and is then, the, the global level, right? The, the world level or is it? This is world level. So right. um, the the uh, racquetball is in the Pan American Games. Um, it's not in the Olympics. So this is as high as, as you can go for uh, racquetball. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I love your great smile there. You definitely are enjoying the moment there. And I think there's one more. Mm, this way? There it is. Mm. So this is me, the uh, the woman from USA Racquetball. She goes, oh, you're from, you're from Canada. Um, do you want to come in and take a picture? Because uh, Kobe was competing against the American. So we jumped into the court. We weren't supposed to be in the court. But mm. we jumped in, got a picture of the two players before they started, and then somebody snapped the picture up in the stands. I don't know who, yeah. but they put it on Facebook. Mm. And I am so grateful to whoever that was that took mm -hmm. this picture. Mm -hmm. Because, like, to me, this is one of those moments where, like, everything came, you know, together for me. You know, mm -hmm. all the sports, the the training of the coaches, the 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 scene, the end result with the athlete, you know, living his dream, making it to the level he aspired to. And uh, I was part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, um, again, if I can recap a little bit, uh, born and raised in St. Albert, got into uh, uh, gymnastic and, and uh, competed at a very uh, national level and and have your experiences and, and stumbling uh, uh, through that and, and getting back up and getting back up and getting back up and, and, and discover public speaking and coaching and training and, and helping others to kind of do what it is that they do. And, and through that, you've been able to kind of bring all of those things together to really a, a world-class level here where you were a, a part in um, helping uh, an awesome athlete win, win bronze at the uh, world stage. That's awesome. And you know, there's another, uh, a couple things you don't see in this picture, but in racquetball, we have referees, mm. right? And, and so they're outside the court and they're, they're looking, you know, they're calling the game because it's a very fast moving game. Mm -hmm. um, but they're also making sure that um, like when the ball bounces twice, it's out, mm. but sometimes it skips and it's so hard to see. So you have um, at this level, you have three refs mm. that are actually monitoring this game. And one of the other things I was really proud of that we did with Alberta Racquetball is we developed referees as well. So we were developing athletes, we were developing coaches and referees. And we had um, one of our, um, well, two of our refs um, go on to represent Canada um, internationally. And at the Pan Am Games, because it was in Canada, we actually were able to send a number of our refs um, to this event. and. It was like a highlight for them. So like to be engaged in the sport, not only as parents and coaches and athletes, but also as referees. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, what I'd like to do is ask you this um, kind of summarizing question. But but uh, in facilitating that, I'm going to actually put this on uh, kind of a slideshow kind of view here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, uh, just just uh, reorganize the, the order of these things in just a moment here. So give me a second to go ahead and do that. So um, tell us, as you glance at the photos, um, are there areas that we haven't talked about that, that you wanted to uh, kind of touch on during our conversation here, Barbara, in terms of the uh, any aspects of, uh, of your uh, journey that, that uh, you can glean up some stories and, and, and insights for our viewers? Um, as you watch the photos, that might also trigger some uh, thoughts as well, or maybe so, some thoughts that are independent of the photos. Do you want me to stop you on a photo? You bet, so absolutely. There's a, there's a good one right there. Uh -huh. um, so we... Um, 
a few years ago, I got a call from some of the gymnasts that I used to train with at the University of Alberta. Mm -hmm. So I went on to compete for the University of Alberta for two years and we won Canada West Championships my first year and we were national champions my second year. And uh, we, they were having a, or planning a 30 year gymnastics reunion. So at the U of A, gymnastics was a varsity sport for 30 years. Mm. And we wanted to basically get everyone together that was part of that program. And they wanted me to be on the board. And at the time I was just too busy to volunteer to be on the board to organize it. But I said, you know what? I would be so happy to MC the event. Mm. I would love to be part of it. And, you know, in terms of a, a time commitment, I, I would I would love to do that. So it was it was a really uh, awesome, amazing, wonderful event. But as you can imagine, everybody was so excited to see everyone else um, that it was a hard, um, a hard um, audience to control. <laughs> so, mm, yeah. so it was it was kind of funny because I had to take it took me about 10 minutes to get everybody to sit down and calm down yeah. and get their attention up to the front. <laughs> and then once we did, it was so worth it. You know, we had slideshows with pictures. We yeah, had it's like you people, among, among family almost kind of feel right. Oh, it was so incredible. We had people sharing memories. So all those skills that I had learned doing stand up comedy and dealing with unruly crowds and <laughs> and, uh, you know, all my skills, interviewing people um, and entertaining the audience, they all really came together in this event. And it was the neatest thing to just see all these people that, um, you know, it was a short time that we were together, but a very important time of my life when I was on the gymnastics team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. Let's uh, continue here on the app. Uh, so, yeah, uh, as you see the photos flashing by or, or any thoughts that come up, I wanted to... sure. Uh, Squeeze, I can talk. Squeeze the, squeeze the juice out of our time here together, my friend. Yeah, Barbara. right here. This would be a good one <laughs> okay, to stop yeah, on. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, coming back. Oh, they're all so good. Um, <laughs> so um, when I was in the hospital with the pulmonary embolisms, I had a, a very difficult time in the hospital. Um, mm. What happened is there was a bed shortage. Um, I was stuck in emergency for two and a half days mm -hmm. because there was no bed available for me. Um, I ended up getting moved to nine different beds in eight days and it was just not uh, the part where they saved my life was awesome. Mm -hmm. I was super happy about <laughs> the, that part, but after I really felt vulnerable and I felt alone and I felt like I wasn't uh, necessarily re receiving the type of care that I, I would have liked at that time in my life. And, um, I ended up writing a letter and, um, I, it took me six months to write it. So it was a very emotional letter. I had uh, PTSD after mm -hmm. my hospital stay. And, um, and it was very interesting because when, when things in healthcare aren't going well, um, I, I think there's this feeling that they can't fix it. They can't make changes to it. It's just the way it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, well, that's not okay. Like I needed to be treated better and, and being stuck in emergency for two and a half days was not okay. And, and um, you know, being moved nine times and in eight days was not okay. And, and there were just other things like that. And I um, ended up getting a letter back from the, um, I'm trying to remember um, the, the name of the fellow who was like in charge of Alberta Health Services at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And he wrote me a letter back. And basically the letter said, we moved you for your own good. Then we moved you for the good of other patients. And then we left you covered in blood. That wasn't so good, but we talked to the uh, the nurse who did that. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, are you kidding me? Like that is not resolution. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt it was important because of my skills and my training and my ability to communicate my ideas. I thought it was really important for me to follow through, you know, for other patients. Mm -hmm. So I ended up calling um, the, the name of the assistant in the letter. So I didn't get the phone number of the fellow that wrote the letter, but when I got this assistant on the, on the, the phone, first thing I said to him, is, I said, who wrote the letter? And he goes, well, I did. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, did he even read the letter? And he goes, yeah, he read it. He signed it. And I said, well, I have a real problem with this. And we started talking and, uh, and he said, well, like, it, it's not like your life was put at risk or anything. Mm -hmm. And I said, actually it was 
I said, when I was stuck in emergency, you know, for two and a half days and they removed the catheter and I had to go to the bathroom, the nurse came in. It took me half an hour to get a nurse to come in. But when the nurse came in, um, I said, I have to go to the bathroom. She goes, well, just go. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, well, what about my oxygen? She goes, just take it off and go. Mm -hmm. So I went by myself down the hall, around the corner to the bathroom with no oxygen on. Mm -hmm. I was full of anticoagulants mm -hmm. or blood thinners. And when I climbed back into bed, my O2 level had dropped to 70%, which is life-threatening. Mm -hmm. So when I told him that, he was like, oh, he goes, would you like to talk to someone at the Royal Alexander Hospital? And I said, uh, yeah, I would. And he set up a meeting with me and uh, Dr. Curtis Johnson, who was the chief medical officer at the time. And Dr. Johnson met with me and I, I told him my story about what happened when I was in the hospital. And he was shaking by the end of our conversation. And he was like, you had a horrible patient experience. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was just so taken aback by it. And he said, would you be willing to come in and talk to our staff? I, I said, I will do anything I can to help. And he goes, if you could come in and share your patient experience. So I did. And uh, then they invited me back to talk to another group. And I kind of forgot about it, right? Mm -hmm. Issue resolved. I, I spoke up. They heard me. And, and to me, that was the most important thing is that they heard me and they were willing to make changes. Mm -hmm. So a few years went by and I got a call back um, or an email from Dr. Johnson inviting me to a patient and provider care experience summit. Mm -hmm. And he started telling me about all the changes that they're making at the Royal Alexandra because of my story. And I was just like, like, wow. Mm -hmm. And he goes, I would really like it if you would be my guest. He goes, you changed me as a leader. Like as a result of you sharing your story, I have changed the way I lead the hospital. Mm -hmm. And they brought me into this event and he said, is it okay if I share your story? I'm like, absolutely. And I jokingly said, I said, the hardest thing is going to be, you know, me just sitting there. I'm going to want to get up and say something. And, and he goes, sure, you can get up and say something. And they gave me an award mm -hmm. and it was, oh, sorry, dude. Um, mm -hmm. It was a really special moment to be recognized um, for speaking up and to have been heard and to be heard to the fact or to the point where they actually have implemented changes at the hospital. Yeah. So I know sometimes it's hard, you know, for people to speak up and, you know, part of the, the thing that, that I'm really excited about with the leadership development program that I've developed is we have nine days, you know, they might be spread over nine months, but where we develop those communication skills that our emerging leaders can now use with their, with their team and with their staff to make their workplaces better not only for customers, but for employees. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that story. Again, uh, uh, there are there is power in stories and, and stories uh, well told to the appropriate people who are ready to hear the stories. Um, you know, great things can happen from that. And it sounds like it's a great example of that. And uh, um, well, thank you for sharing that, uh, Barbara. You're welcome. And this is my grandson. And mm -hmm. uh, I sent you that photo because one of our favorite things to do is to go swimming. Mm -hmm. And what is so interesting about watching him swim is every time, like every single time we get in the pool, he tries something new. Mm. So at this stage in his development, he was learning how to jump off the edge. And what's so interesting about that is this innate um, desire that he has to learn and develop and grow. And uh, now he's like a fish and, <laughs> and we're in the deep end and now he's swimming over top of me and underneath me. And he wants to wrestle like a dinosaur in the water. And, and like, we just have so much fun. And, and all I've, all I've done is provided the environment, you know, the water taking him swimming. And then I just follow his lead. Yeah. 
You bet. You know, as they say, you know, leadership is, is to create the environment that is conducive to the vision that we have. So if you have a vision for, in this case, your grandson to develop in a certain way or develop certain skills, uh, you just create the environment where they can flourish. And when they do, they will surprise you with um, what they can do in that environment. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you're welcome. And the, the thing about, um, I'll just go back to my grandson. So when, um, when I was in the hospital, and I um, was given the choice, like, you're going to die, or we can give you the clot buster. What was really interesting about that moment is I had a voice inside my head, um, basically screaming, I don't want to die. Mm -hmm. I'm not done being a mom, and I want to meet my grandkids. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I didn't have any grandkids yet. Mm -hmm. So when I survived, um, a couple years later, um, my daughter came home and she told me she was pregnant and it was the happiest day of my life. Mm. And every day that I get to see Jonathan, I am just filled with such incredible joy and so grateful for every moment we get to spend together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, again, challenges and what I'm going to call um, uh, challenges and, and really obstacles and and, and uh, blocks and and uh, really adversity has a way of um, building us in, in ways that we're, we're not uh, aware of or maybe surprised and one of those things that it does it, it makes us grateful for for the good times that we have and and you know dune it it also like that experience as difficult as it was for me to go through it changed me as a speaker and a teacher mm -hmm. so so, I mean, it was a life, you know, it was a life event mm -hmm. that had such a profound impact on me that when I got out of the hospital, I couldn't even stand up and talk. Mm -hmm. So there was so much heart and lung damage that um, I had no breath support and I had to sit. And I was used to being really active on stage. And what I realized is that I had to change the way I teach. Mm -hmm. And I ended up sort of um, being way more connected and interested and engaged um, in the people that I was working with um, and less interested in the content. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what was really cool about that shift is people really responded to it well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I, the feedback that I started getting from people was less about the actual content of what I was teaching and more about the transformation mm -hmm. that they were going through and knowing that I actually cared about what they were going through mm -hmm. uh, made a lot of the difference because I could relate. Yeah. Uh, just like music in many ways, it parallels music in the sense of uh, a really fantastic expert performer is not going to use all the notes and all the chords that they know is not going to just dump the stuff to you your musical content they're going to create a musical experience a journey with their audience using some very strategically chosen uh, you know chords and and notes and, and whatever have you so so the ability to say i don't have to inflict all of my knowledge on every group that i meet up with that's wisdom well, it only took 55 years to get here, so. <laughs> but you're now at the, what they say, Freedom 55, my friend. But, uh, Freedom 55. Remember those commercials with the convertible <laughs> Freedom 55. So, and so I think this is the last picture that we haven't covered. Okay. And, yeah. um, well, and I'm, I'm sure your viewers are wondering, what is the beautiful woman in the red dress doing in my slide deck? I'm okay and, with that. I'm okay with that. Yeah, this woman, uh, she's amazing. She called me up and she said, I'm entering the Miss uh, Canada uh, Canada pageant and I, I really need help with my public speaking. Uh, can you help me? And uh, she ended up coming for a couple sessions with me and it was amazing how easy it was to work with her. Um, you know, one is she had some really incredible ideas and, and uh, she's, you know, was was really driven to get better. So, um, you know, basically I worked with getting her connected to her heart so she could bring those ideas out to the world. And uh, she ended up second runner up in the contest. So she was very happy with the work that I did with her. So her name is Catherine? Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. Um, where was this? Do you recall? Or um, I'm not sure where the contest was. Mm -hmm. um, 
but um, um, if you go on my website, there's a quote from her and mm -hmm. that'll give you a little more of the details. You bet. Yeah, there you go, folks. And again, in case you've forgotten her website, Barbara May. So Barbara May dot com. Just first name, last name dot com. There you go. <laughs> so, Barbara, again, um, you know, we have time. So if there's any area that you want to chat about that we haven't gotten to, you know, when I reach out and say, hey, Barbara, would you like to chat for an hour and a bit? And uh, I did warn you that some of us, uh, some of the guests run over the hour and we did as well. So so. Uh, uh, but if there's areas that you want to chat about that we haven't yet, uh, I'd be happy to uh, to uh, listen and, and uh, have conversation about that, my friend. Well, so, you know, what springs to mind here, Dune, is, you know, you and I have known each other for a number of years. And every time I meet with you, whether we're having coffee or we're at a CAPS event or in this case, um, you know, we always learn more about each other. And mm -hmm. like to me, that is what friendship is about. And, you know, I think the older I get and at this point in my life, I'm really valuing um, the people that are in my life and and the time I get to spend with them. So, you know, we might not see each other every week or even every month, but when we do have a chance to connect, mm -hmm. it is a is a really um, important thing to me. And and, you know, the older I get, the more I realize just how special that is. Yeah, we're. we're uh... We're social creatures and, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of work you do. Uh, we're in a, a people business. And so the more we can uh, connect with the people around us, uh, again, be present, as you mentioned. And uh, so it, it's been a wonderful pleasure to uh, chat with you, Barbara, for the last uh, hour and a half, actually. Uh, and uh, uh, viewers, folks uh, who uh, if you have questions for Barbara now or later on, feel free to uh, comment in the comment section there and uh, we'll be able to monitor that 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 section and, and uh, Barbara will be able to uh, respond to any questions uh, that you have. Uh, but as we uh, wrap around, wrap up this segment here, uh, I'm going to again turn the steering wheel over to you, Barbara. Take us home in however you want it to uh, to do that. If you want to sing, go ahead and sing. If you want to tell a do a what is it a comedy routine, go ahead and do that. It, anything at all, I'm going to be a willing passenger to uh, you wrapping us up there, my friend. And when we're done, um, just hang around in the green room for a minute or so, and I'll just give you a high five in the. Green Green room there. But to our viewers, folks, thank you for joining us uh, on do Conversations with Dune and Friends. You've been listening to Barbara May. And uh, uh, yeah, feel free to, again, ask questions uh, after the show as well. And uh, the recording will be on there forever, we hope, on Facebook. And I'll be uploading it to YouTube as well. So uh, again, thank you, Barbara, for spending the time with us and sharing your uh, journey and, and stories and insights with us. And uh, so here's Barbara to take us out, friends. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really, I don't know how to, how to, how to, uh, what you want me to say here, but if you go back... Uh... Oh, your sound, if you could do uh, check your sound there again. On the microphone there. Okay, there you go. Uh, yeah, I hear you. Uh, we're just on the wrong mic here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you go back to the slide with uh, my studio and the drums, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, there, that's actually Joey's studio. So Joey has a music studio. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we're in a four level split and on the fourth level we have a music studio on my third level we have a video studio so what's really cool and, and what's been really neat about this journey that i'm on is is um oh your sound again yeah go ahead yeah, just being able to work together and, you know, support each other. So, you know, when when he comes to my shows and is able to help me out with things and I get to go to his shows and help him out with things, um, it, it's really interesting to work together. And, and so one of the things that I have been learning how to do is play the drums. And if we were able to just uh, scoot downstairs, I would show you my very beginner level drumming. But what, what's really interesting about it is I picked up the drums when I was in my 40s and it had been something that I always thought about doing. I, I have a, a picture of me one Christmas when I'm about 10 years old and my cousin got a drum kit and I was so jealous. You know, I, I was like, wow, I'd really like to have my own drum kit and, and learn how to play the drums. So 
when I was in my 40s, I, I finally decided, you know, time is going to go by whether or not I learned to play the drums or not. So what I did is I bought my own drum kit. And within about two days of buying the drum kit, I met Joey and uh, he came into my life. So um, I have a great teacher and, and it is just so important to have a hobby. So you and I have talked a lot about high performance and taking people to that next level, which is definitely one of the things I specialize in. But I also appreciate and value the importance of just doing something because you want to. Mm -hmm. And it can be a hobby. It doesn't have to be something that you get really good at. You can just do it because you enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Life is more than a career. Life mm -hmm. is much more than a career. Uh, great to have a career. You want to do well at it. And career is much more than a job. So, so uh, as I said in my social media post uh, one time, you know, your, your career is much more than your job and your life is much, much more than your career. So uh, I think uh, that resonates with you as well. I think we, we go to the same school when it comes to that there, uh, Barbara. In fact, we probably went to the same school on many, <laughs> many things. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me on your show today, Dune. Well, thank you, Barbara, for uh, joining us uh, for a wonderful conversation. Uh, so, folks, till we meet again, have a wonderful day and, and take good care of yourself. Take good care of one another and just be kind. When in doubt, be kind. When not in doubt, still be kind. Thank you. <laughs>